Okay, good afternoon. A pleasure to be here and as your final speaker of today. So, as he mentioned already, uh, my name is Anne Toivonen. I'm actually working as a senior lecturer at the moment in tourism department in Finland in a university called Haga Helia. I'm also a pioneering researcher on sustainable space tourism. I did write a book, a non-fiction book, uh, two years ago that was published in the UK. And it's the world's first book uh, talking about um, sustainability in future news space industry. I also established three years ago a university called, a course called Responsible Space Tourism that I have been teaching now three years for over 500 students. So that's a little bit of my background, so you know who you are listening to. Then, just to start with this quote by Stephen Hawking. As you can see, it says, I don't think the human race will survive the next thousand years unless we spread into space. So I could now maybe slightly open up this concept of what is actually meant when you tie up sustainable development and space tourism, because obviously that's a very paradoxical combination. However, it was about 15 years ago, there was an academic, uh, Stephen Fawkes, who made um, levels of sustainability, he kind of created them in a base of another type of model, defining that there are actually five uh, parts that you could achieve sustainability in this future industry. And first level is infrastructural level. So basically anything from designing the space suits, when you build up space ports, uh, all access to, to space ports, how people actually get to these, all these could be you know, designed in a kind of following the sustainable, sustainable development principles. And that's kind of common nowadays anyway. We do have this climate change crisis at the moment. Obviously, to start a new tourism sector in this kind of moment is not a good timing. So, but that I will be slightly touching later. Uh, then you have a cultural level of sustainability, meaning uh, educating, for example, people about space more, and also the kind of awe feeling that if a tourist goes to space and they see Earth, when you're up in space, it's a horrible environment for human body, for example. That could be some kind of a, a moment to wake up for some of these wealthy ones who would go there first. Hopefully, they will donate uh, money for some environmental programs after they really, you know, feel it and understand. As we are all kind of realize already that we only have this one planet Earth at the moment that we can actually survive. But um, so that's the kind of one levels. Also, you have um, economic level, meaning just like this will create new jobs uh, to areas, for example. And then you have resource level, which is kind of what uh, Jeff Bezos did mention when he went to space last summer, basically justifying it um, like the longer, uh, long term goal of his is to literally move all the heavy industry from Earth and you know, bring the resources from space. Uh, obviously, that's a very, there are a lot of ethical and moral issues behind such an idea. In theory, it sounds great when you think that we can just leave some areas of Earth preserved. We don't touch those for 100 years and then we just get everything from space. But at the same time, what right do we have as humans now then to go to destroy space environment after we have destroyed our planet Earth? So a lot of these kind of questions need to be, I think, answered before it actually can start happening. And also technology as well needs to be de developed. And then uh, as kind of to refer this uh, slide here, survival level of um, sustainability in space tourism, meaning surviving the humans. We are in a very lonely place in the universe at the moment. There could be asteroid. We saw in Corona um, situation that we kind of, many of us wish that there could be like maybe planet B to escape because, um, so just the kind of sustaining humans. So those are the kind of levels just opening up what it actually means when you tie up sustainability and space tourism. Then just to kind of 
show this photo. I think that was actually quite good. I saw this two years ago in the leading uh, newspaper in Finland, Helsingin Sanomat. And I first thought that is that some kind of visionary image of you know a future colony in Mars or something, how we could kind of maybe live there. But it was actually an invention called Corona Helmet. And it kind of made sense. I was thinking that, wow, that I, I want to have such a helmet. It was just the first six months we had already started to wear masks and such. And I was thinking that that's really a good idea. But at the same time, you, you kind of start thinking that we, we, we are really starting to create the space environment already on the soil of Earth. We are getting accustomed to these kind of things. Uh, so at the some point we, when we have most likely a colony on the soil of Mars, we already have a society as humans that we are maybe accustomed more to such change than, for example, as it used to be before. Then, just to show this kind of uh, image of uh, Pan American World Air Airways and Hilton Hotels uh, advertising uh, kind of uh, vis visions, space tourism is nothing new. Basically, when there was this 1950s space race between USA and Soviet Union, a lot of Hollywood films came out uh, after that. And during 1960s, it was kind of really considered it's only a matter of a couple of years that, uh, like normal people, common men could also go to space alongside astronauts. And even like 1968, where these two photos are from, uh, Pan American opened this kind of first moon flights club that you could kind of uh, join, that because they thought that it's only like three years that you, you are in Moon, they are taking tourists there. Also, uh, Baron Hilton, which is maybe the younger generation knows better as uh, the grandfather of Paris Hilton, he has been a really visionary in uh, space, in regards to space. So he was kind of visioning already that there could be like a Hilton hotel in the orbital, orbital uh, like uh, environment. So just to really highlight that there is nothing new in space tourism, it really has been uh, existing for a long time. However, it was only last year when these billionaires, uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, they all managed to get tourists into space environment for the first time. Also, NASA has started a space tourism activity. There have been some tourists in the International Space Station. Uh, this is a costly activity at the moment. You need to be very wealthy. There are a lot of queues, only a couple of vehicles. This is just to start. So we are in the first kind of pace. It, you could almost relate like how aviation industry started uh, 100 years ago. It starts like a, elite, a small elite activity, and then you have a couple of decades when you get better vehicles and technology develops and the prices go down. And suddenly we are just having a holiday in, in an orbital hotel or somewhere else. So these are the companies at the moment. Really, you know, a lot of uh, you must all have been maybe seeing and uh, these in news that uh, Richard Branson was the first one to make it, and then Jeff Bezos went there. Ten, uh, ten days later, and then uh, Elon Musk's uh, inspiration crew, he wasn't on board himself, but in September, it actually went to orbit. Then, just to um, uh, show this photo of kind of two visions now, because I'm a tourism res researcher, so this is a completely new area of uh, tourism at the moment. We are talking about future tourism, something that doesn't yet exist, so you need to really use this kind of future forecasting tools to even make sense in a way that, uh, uh, you know, of course, lots of visions have been existing for like 100, 200 years. We have been reading a lot of science fiction novels, some of them date uh, to, to 1800s, and uh, we all are very familiar with space because we have been seeing movies. We kind of almost think that we know the place. It's kind of when you are creating a new image, destination image uh, of a place, uh, like we all know some places um, and destination on Earth that we have never ever visited. For example, like uh, Los Angeles, Hollywood. A lot of people haven't even ever been there, but they kind of feel that they know that destination because it's so much uh, in all kinds of movies and such. So the space is a li little bit of a similar case now when you think of a new destination. Uh, and then there will be a lot of kind of different packages that this uh, will have. And as I did mention, the economic level of uh, sustainability, this is going to be a huge industry. It has been estimated uh, by UBS Bank 
um, I think it was about um, like a four billion dollar forecast in the next 10 years. And then 20 billion dollar um, uh, like a forecast for if you include uh, supersonic flights which is kind of maybe something that the common man will at first start doing, because with the space jumps, but as I have kind of um, named these, uh, now these Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin um, activities for tourists, you go up, up to 100 uh, kilometers about uh, Virgin Galactic goes to 80, then you're kind of seeing the curvature of the air, uh, Earth and you feel the kind of weightlessness. And then you pay like 450,000 for that 10-minute uh, floating experience. So basically, uh, just to kind of refer to that, that you need a spaceport, that where your actually touristic activity starts, and they're kind of already, you could see uh, two different styles. So first one is from a picture from a spaceport, uh, Cor Cornwall, which is in the United Kingdom. So it's kind of like uh, combining like a normal aviation kind of, it's like an aviation center for like uh, no normal planes, and then you could have these supersonic jets that literally go via space. You could, uh, SpaceX has actually calculated that it only would take 39 minutes from New York to Shanghai if uh, the plane goes via space environment, instead of the 15-hour uh, flight, uh, what it currently takes. Of course, then it will be a huge game changer for the whole aviation industry as well, if these kind of planes start to, to develop. Environmental-wise, you would kind of think that it kind of makes sense to only have a 39-minute flight instead of a 15-hour flight, the emissions and such. So there are these kind of angles now, really, to think. And obviously now when the technology is developing, as he was speaking earlier, like lots of new things are coming. So that's something that really needs to be involved in this new touristic activity from uh, the beginning. And that's why academics like myself, we are writing books and uh, publishing articles and such to kind of remind these people that, you know, please uh, do this uh, in a right way from, from a start, because they have a good place now to do it, since they are only in the kind of first part. So then the other uh, picture is like Wenhan Space Launch Center from China. So basically, it's kind of more like a touristic destination, lesser center, that you would have a beach and maybe a space museum, and then you pop into space for like, like you have a one week holiday there, and then you have this space visit like in the halfway of your visit. So it could be like normal kind of sun, sea, uh, and sand holiday plus the space visit. So these kind of two spaceport vision and kind of um, ways are already, I could, I have been like, um, I think uh, are interesting to, to know. Then lastly, just to touch my book, what I, as I mentioned, wrote uh, two years ago. And this is the first kind, so basically when these billionaires went to space um, and the global media obviously wanted to have some comments from some tourism side people and the only person they were able to find was me because I was, I just literally, I think it came out six months before, before these uh, guys went to space. So it was handily fair. So I was happy to tell that all these journalists that yes, there is a book about this whole phenomena please go and read it. So I was able to kind of, with my academic uh, research, I did seven years of a PhD called The Emergence of New Space Tourism as well. So the um, whole of my PhD is the world first, first for that, and, uh, and uh, it's available also in the internet if somebody wants to read more. But basically, this is kind of covering now these angles that I have been mentioning here about introducing this, what is meant by this new tourism sector. What are the players? What are the kind of uh, motives? Uh, then, obviously, background to sustainability, as I know, uh, mentioned uh, in my beginning of my speech, we, ha we have a horrible situation at the moment in, in the planet. Nothing can be uh, planned and actioned uh, in future uh, without thinking of the environment. That needs to be included in every single thing. Otherwise, we are in really, we need that pla uh, planet B option like straight away because um, and that's what these are building obviously like Elon Musk have bases are really visionaries there was even an article uh, it was in early 1990s or not late 1980s in Miami local newspaper it, it, it's a reporter interviewed Jeff Bezos when he was 18 years old and he was already visioning like a colony in Mars and how there would be like amusement parks and all that 
And also Elon Musk always has been a space enthusiastic. So these guys, at least they kind of know what they're doing in a way that they have been exposed to this. It's not like a sudden uh, topic for them. And they have visions that we will have a colony, that we are kind of spreading the people out. And that kind of goes under that category of survival level of sustainability in space tourism. Of course, again, the ethical, moral issues. Is it just right that the humans go? Like, what about the animals and plants here in Earth? All these kind of questions uh, need to be, the academy especially, like I always encourage, as I said, like I have created this university course, I always encourage my students that please join, uh, join me in this writing because that's been quite a lonely place. Uh, that is, it would be better to have uh, more, more people researching this as well. Then just touching also like uh, the planning sustainable uh, space tourism and the society, as I mentioned, the ethical side, morals and uh, company responsibility. Is it kind of whose responsibility, let's say that there could be some compensation like aviation industry has, for example, that when you, if you go to space, then you pay for some kind of compensation. But then again, is it like then the, uh, the passenger who pays it or is it the company who pays it and all that? Of course, like Jeff Bezos did when he came back from space, he did donate 200 million to two charity programs. So that was good. And it kind of helped that I had been highlighting that quite a lot in the media in the previous week, saying that if you go, then you pay. So hopefully um, that helped at least a little bit. Uh, yes, so basically that's in a nutshell. I see that I have 20 seconds left, so I will be just clicking this last uh, slide here. And uh, I thank you very much, and I, I hope that you learned a little bit now about this new uh, space tourism industry that you can maybe share your knowledge to other people as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aneta. <laughs> All right. Just very quickly at the end of the day, is it, um, I mean, we're, we're, today we're in Tartu, Estonia. You come from Helsinki mm. in Finland. This feels about as far away as possible from space launches in Florida, from rockets going up in SpaceX, like, uh, I don't know, what's that? Why, we, why should we talk about it here in the other edge of Europe? Why is it relevant to us and not mm. to someone in America? Well, it's basically, as it has been kind of the first concern is the emissions. We all have the same air to breathe, and that's the kind of first part. <laughs> sure. If something happens on the other side, we are still kind of sharing quite a lot of things in the planet, so. All right, it's all the one world that we yes. have. Yes, we have to be kind of united in with all these. Because uh, all Finland, for example, like uh, oh, Kiruna, there is a spaceport in Kiruna in Sweden. And uh, also like other like satellite launches, all these, like they are taking place in Europe as well. So they could be tourists as well at some point in this. All right, sites. good. Aneta, thank you very much for thank your time. You, one more round of applause for Aneta Toivinen. Thank you.